I would like to uh, invite Elena Yechnikova. I'm very happy that she participates in our project. She's art historian. She is working uh, at, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. She's an independent curator, and she's going to tell us uh, um, some examples from the U.S. Uh, history, beginning with 1960s up to now. Well, so I'm going to talk about self-organized artistic initiatives, art traditions in Europe and USA in the period from 1960s through 1990s uh, by the example of five five sides. And I would like to start with a short theoretical introduction. Perhaps something will seem to be quite evident and you're quite familiar uh, with this postulate, but I think still it's, it makes sense to uh, repeat them for a start and so it'll be uh, more interesting to look at the practical cases in the second part well already having some refreshed theoretical basis so well the self-organized art initiatives as you understand are the areas of art or spaces of art, they might be ephemeric, they might be not necessarily tangible, but in my presentation mostly I'll be talking about physical, tangible sites or places created and supported by the artists themselves as an alternative to the existing art system. And in this case, probably, well, the key word is the word alternative, although it might be questionable and we'll get to this concept a bit later. So the space of this kind makes it possible for that is to demonstrate the art out of the system of museums and commercial galleries, thus being free of these institutions. They also uh, help to control the process of production of works and its de public demonstration and also uh, dissemination of information about their works and bringing the knowledge, uh, notice to the public a notion to the public and establishing contacts with the con colleagues in the local context or even with uh, those from overseas. Besides that, such uh, places will uh, give an opportunity to not just to demonstrate the works but also will uh, they uh, use the, as the artist uh, studios and also places for the communal life. So what are the most evident uh, and specific features of these uh, sites, well, applicable to the majority of them. Well, first of all, uh, well, first, the decision which works to be demonstrated, when and where, are taken by the artists themselves. Secondly, well, uh, uh, management of these uh, sites are based on the uh, principles of self-management, otherwise they themselves collectively in consensus define the main principles and rules for controlling and managing the space based on the uh, parties' agreement. Thirdly, well, the artists control the process of uh, dissemination of information about works. Uh, number four, well, the artists will provide uh, mutual assistance to each other, well, which might be intellectual uh, support when they get into the groups, or it may be simple uh, material support when the artist takes certain place and place uh, to be used as a studio and they share the expenses or rent. Another uh, specific feature, specifically typical of that period of 1960s to 90s is that, uh, well, mostly these places or sites are used for demonstration of avant-garde art, new art, which at that point in time, well, they are commercial galleries and museums still uh, haven't decided to demonstrate yet, to show on their premises. And also, 
uh, we should list three more characteristics. Uh, so, firstly, so these sites are not non-commercial. Uh, that means uh, not that they cannot sell the work if there is a customer, buyer, but it's simply stated that the commercial uh, results uh, are not the most important target of this of this enterprise. Uh, secondly, what's also very important is that uh, artists um, strive to establish close and better relations with the uh, surrounding community, not only with uh, artist peers. And the last thing that the artists involved in this organization uh, quite often is connected in the, or interlinked with some political initiative. Uh, what else should be mentioned is that in most cases, especially in the initial uh, period of time, period of the uh, uh, phase of the spirit, uh, had very limited budgets and mostly they've been uh, opening in the uh, less privileged, poor part of towns with uh, the buildings not initially not uh, planned to be the place for our demonstration. And uh, again, uh, returning to the first point, well, the self-organized art initiatives, well, they um, criticize the existing system, which is most typically, well, they bring up the most important issues, social and political, and in the period of uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, mostly, uh, where that was also involving uh, critique of commercial uh, modification of art and again referring returning back to the word alternative quite often these sites were called alternative sites because that was definitely an alternative in the system of art at the same time well uh, this uh, word alternative should be interpreted with certain uh, uh, certain footnotes, certain uh, clarifications, because that uh, will definitely refer to, uh, to the extent of uh, possibilities for alternative uh, exist in the existing world, and talking about self-organized art spaces, uh, well, despite their initial intention uh, to represent an alternative, nevertheless they were still fitting into the overall global general system of art, although occupying their certain alternative niche. And speaking about the financial aspect, as I said earlier, all these sites were non-profit, non-commercial or even anti-commercial initiatives but nevertheless, they still uh, were uh, partaking in the global economy, capitalist economy, and in this respect, we can focus on three uh, most outstanding moments. Firstly, gentrification, uh, which you're all familiar with, with this concept, I guess, and uh, in Moscow, well, starting from early 2000s, it, was, it had become quite a noticeable event, although not very much reflected in the media. It stands for, you know, the moment when uh, an artist like uh, squatting, you know, taking, you know, uh, spaces or apartments in some abandoned buildings, uh, using it as their studios, thus, you know, upgrading the status and the image of these locations after that they are asked so to speak to vacate these premises and later some other redevelopment is happening there into a kind of lofts like in Krasnaya Oktyabr factory for example so gentrification where uh, the artists take uh, part even against their will another uh, aspect is the following. Well, the artists who develop and employ their own dependent uh, artistic sites, well, they need certain financial support and just for the sake of attracting grant, grants, 
uh, well, they uh, kind of register uh, their uh, unions or amalgamation with certain getting some legal uh, status. Uh, well, they need to have to be a legal entity just to uh, be able to receive to receive uh, the grants. And the third aspect is a so-called farm system, uh, like uh, you know breeding den or whatever they call it, or uh, uh, it's a practice when museum curators or commercial galleries are searching for new names exactly on these among such alternative art sites well for later bringing them into the mainstream dominating uh, art so all these three phenomena which I uh, had described well give us all reasons to say that the word alternative is definitely a good uh, proper adjective but it should be used with certain you know uh, uh, second thought in your mind another situation American artist Julie Vold well um, from uh, Teal Group if I heard it right she is studying the history of all alternative art sites in New York starting from 60s as well. She's publishing books and different texts and articles, well, and lots of interviews as well. If back in 1996 the word interview in New York was still actively used in local vocabulary, then by year 2000 it was already out of circulation. Another reflection on uh, the word and concept of uh, alternative. And now looking at the chronology, chronological period, which is uh, we're taking from 1960s through 1990s, I'd like to give a little description of uh, specific, you know, uh, features of every decade in the span, maybe in big strokes, but still it might be interesting, I hope. Uh, so, the appearance of all alternative and uh, self-organized uh, art initiatives uh, were closely related to the spirit of freedom typical of art of 1960s where the boundaries of art expanded in terms of different sorts of media happenings uh, minimalism process art etc and uh, then artists started getting into a certain grouping or unions and then uh, the peak of this movement uh, was reached in the uh, 1970s, talking about the USA. It was the period of recession, otherwise economically it wasn't the best uh, time. And then in the 60s lots of new, very active artists appeared on the scene and of course all of them could not be uh, represented and shown in the existing museums and galleries, so artists had to take the initiative to take the whole business in their hands. And that's why in the 60s lots of alternative art sites had popped up in the city. And then later in 1970s, and that was slightly a different time, well, such sites also continue to appear, but at a much lesser scale, and they're looking back at the experience the situation of 1960, which was an ideal situation, because it was economically difficult and politically difficult time, and that's why, well, for the artist, it was not an easy situation. And in the 1980s, well, still the sites appear on the scene, but in much lesser quantity, and later on, in 1990s and the year 2000, I think, makes sense to unite these two last decades, because here we have totally different economic background, a non-material economy, creative class, and so on and so forth. And as it was uh, marked by many uh, researchers whose artists I read, well, the general trend of the 90s, that was the mostly utopian, very free and alternative pathos, which was driving ahead the artists back in the 60s and 70s, is replaced by, by a more pragmatic approach when artists understand that makes things just much easier, it's streamlining the situation just to get in the group, 
to start their own site just to make a statement about themselves and make a uh, next step ahead. And now I'm getting down to specific examples. Well, uh, I personally talking about this self-organized art initiatives, well, there were so many of them in the 60s and 70s in many different countries, it's simply impossible to encompass it and put it into one presentation. That's why I decided to limit myself by five sites, which are slightly different from different periods of time. Perhaps what makes them more interesting in terms of comparison? Well, first place is uh, Building 112 on Green Street in New York Soho. It's uh, 1970. Uh, what was the year? Uh, so this place became one of the first non-commercial alternative galleries set by the artists themselves. So as I said, it all happened in Soho, New York. And uh, it was a very thriving place back in the 70s, although uh, not the best part of town is today turned into a very fluent and rich area. But at that time it was a uh, uh, fairly risky area, sometimes dangerous, where there was a lot of abandoned uh, uh, factories, industrial buildings, warehouses, uh, mostly uh, used by textile and processing industries. As a result, there was lots of these, you know, abandoned spaces which artists started to taking over for their galleries and studios because, well, the rent, uh, rents were very close, so that was the classical scheme of gentrification in its early phase. So, uh, 112 Green Street in Soho, this place was opened by Jeffrey Liu and his wife, Rachel Wood, so they bought this place, this building of several stories. They also had their apartment there and their studio. And the ground floor was uh, empty. So they decided to use this place as a spot for demonstrating and uh, showing different art projects of their colleagues and uh, other artists, well, and their exhibition policy was quite open and practically anybody who could, you know, uh, install and transport their works uh, to this place, they could use it. And the owners easily agreed to uh, such offers and with time uh, in, uh, this place became very thriving, very lively, uh, lots of different exhibitions of art performances as well, and that was the time when, you know, uh, uh, boundaries between different kinds of art were very uh, permeable, and uh, so this place didn't exist uh, for too long. Uh, in 1973, they were given a grant after that Jeff Lulu stepped out of the project due to his personal reasons. Other people had taken the thing, they moved to another place, then to another address, and now this place still exists and it's known as White Column, still, you know, uh, presenting themselves as a non commercial art site, well, uh, still connected to the legendary. Uh, roots, but uh, what you see now on the screen are just, you know, uh, the stills from some exhibitions which uh, were arranged in that place. So, as again, I said, that was the industrial production room with, you know, hanging cables on the ceiling with some, you know, uh, loopholes uh, on the floor, but the artist who uh, demonstrated the works, they liked this environment, and that was mostly artists from post uh, minimalist, you know, uh, movement, and so they've been working in this space because it was kind of consonant to the artistic, you know, 
experiments and that's why a lot of uh, projects were site specific. They were specifically produced for this space, for this place, and on the other side still it was a non-commercial space quite often to different experiments and after you know closure of exhibitions well many of the exhibits were uh, destroyed irrevocably uh, and that's why they said uh, they used to say that it was not a gallery but a kind of a studio for artistic experiments and another interesting uh, moment uh, relating to financing uh, of this mm, place. So as I said, well, it was owned by Jeffrey Liu and Rich Wood, you know, the couple, both artists, and certainly they were, uh, all the artists could use it absolutely free of charge. Still, they still needed some financial, you know, in, uh, infusion, so uh, the founder of this gallery had attracted their friend, uh, Helen Sart, another artist who very actively started looking for funds, otherwise uh, taking the role of a fundraiser. So the first sponsors of the site were the bakers, whose uh, bakeries and uh, bread shops were located nearby also on Green Street, and they supported uh, the artist because uh, due to the classical scheme of gentrification, well, what the artist did was definitely improving and upgrading the overall, you know, uh, uh, quality and standing of the district. So here you see uh, pictures from other projects and exhibitions from that place, uh, musical and choreographical performances, and here's another place which I'd like to tell you about. It's a restaurant called Food, which was uh, started uh, by a well-known artist, Gotham Martin Clark, and that was quite a, a special place. Well, it was open not far from the first gallery, 112 Green Street. They were friends, they were seeing each other, and also it was uh, located in Soha, in the same district. Well, uh, inhabited by lots of artists, and uh, they say that, uh, well, the art artistic community of Soha at that time uh, was about 500 artists. Well, not all of them, of course, were closely related, but they knew each other mostly, so it really was like some, some kind of a big village. Like it is uh, quite commonly described today. And as Gordon Martha Clark and his uh, colleagues, uh, Carol Gordon and Tina Jin, uh, used to say, uh, well, all three founders of this food restaurant, well, their idea was just uh, to arrange and open a place in Soho where all the artists from the local community could get together and uh, meet during, you know, sharing some food. So the idea was that the process of uh, eating or food consumption uh, had to be the moment uh, for socialization and communication. Otherwise, very beneficial and good. Uh, situation for getting to the other. So it was truly a full fledged, you know, full scale restaurant. Uh, and we already see its sign uh, saying food and big uh, facade, glazed facade with its show window and the uh, pieces of paper. We see the other uh, bills or checks which they used for uh, decor, uh, decorating decorative design of the world and on the outside we see the founders Gordon Matthew Clark and his friends who are standing at the doors of the place soon to be uh, the food restaurant. Before that that was kind of an, uh, also an eatery, another place. And here's the flyer announcing about uh, uh, opening this place and as I say that was very simple but very good food mainly 
soups and sandwiches and uh, usually quite affordable but everybody mentioning that was the international cuisine because that was the first place in Soho where they started making sushi and sashimi uh, one of the place uh, and and what, another interesting thing to mention well firstly well it was the place where all the artists from around could uh, get to for food and besides eating and getting together well that was a kind of a, a work market well artists were mainly intermingled there exchanging news and that was the place where they could find jobs well uh, they need time and they need money, of course, and they're not getting regular wages. And Gordon Mother Clark offered to all the artists uh, to work from time to time in the restaurant, just uh, wash dishes or just clean the place or cook. And, and according to the witnesses, well, they were paid pretty good money. Back in the 70s, they were paid $1.05 an hour, which was not not bad deal at all. As a result, they went broke, uh, and well, the ownership was changed, and so new owners were uh, controlling the place. But the idea was still to provide and generate some kind of more or less uh, steady income for the artists in need. Another thing to mention is that this place truly turned into kind of an informal art uh, place, arts side, because they had arranged performances then. So they arranged different performances, film screenings, otherwise that turned the place well for demonstrating art, besides its main function. So every Sunday, every Sunday evening, they had a special program when different artists were invited to become uh, the chef and they were to prepare their own menu. So very uh, famous artists like Robert uh, Rauschenberg or John Cage or Dad, uh, Dad or uh, Gordon Martin Clark also loved cooking and so one of the um, they were doing uh, completely different things, um, uh, you know, they could um, make some uh, courses that were uneatable, you couldn't really eat them, but uh, they were uh, like real arts projects. So this is um, a page that uh, was published in the magazine Avalanche, and uh, you can see the list of all the things that uh, uh, took place uh, during the year since its opening. So quite many interesting things, uh, you can't really see it, um, but uh, anyway. So it was a very funny place, uh, maybe not classical art space, but still um, it was uh, an art space uh, um, to a certain extent and it was very alternative. Uh, and uh, one more example that I wanted to tell you about is the gallery that was opened in the 80s, opened by group material um, uh, Judy Old, that, uh, who was one of the participants of that group. So. Um, so this is um, the time of the 80s, a very different time period, the artists uh, uh, that opened their alternative uh, uh, sites uh, were more um, conscious in terms of um, uh, politics, uh, uh, much more aware of politics than their colleagues in the 70s, so Group Materials was quite uh, a politically oriented artist, so they began to rent uh, um, the uh, space in a very poor area of New York with uh, mainly uh, people from Latin America. Here you can see the facade of this building. And it's very interesting that uh, the first exhibition uh, uh, took place there as well. So it was not only the office but also the gallery. And uh, in uh, 1980 they organized their first exhibition and it's, uh, uh, it was called People's Choice. The second title 
was arras mango. It's a um, Spanish word. So the idea of group material artists uh, was to make this for a special place that would be good not only for specialized audience but also for local people. So the first thing they did was uh, to establish the contacts with the local people, those that lived nearby. And so they uh, sent a letter to everybody living in the neighborhood and they asked everyone to bring uh, some things to the gallery. Some things, not necessarily art objects, not necessarily such artworks, but uh, um, the, the works that were precious uh, uh, to the owners, that had some value. And I wanted to quote this letter, to give you a quote from this letter. So we wanted to show the things that not necessarily find their way to the gallery. There's things that you find beautiful, that you enjoy, that uh, has some meaning, uh, that have some meaning for you or your friends or your family. They could be uh, some photos or maybe um, your favorite posters or things you collect that would be good for the exhibition. And um, uh, the residents didn't really uh, respond at first, but uh, um, uh, in a way, while they brought some uh, different things to the gallery and it was a very interesting exhibition. Uh, the walls um, uh, were covered with different things uh, from floor to the ceiling and you can see a piece of this wall on the screen right now. And it's also interesting uh, that this gallery existed only for one year. Then it was uh, shut down. Uh, this was the artist's decision. and. Uh, it's very interesting um, to look into the reason uh, for shutting down this gallery. The artist decided that um, the, uh, since they were quite politicized artists, they uh, had to use a different strategy, not to, you know, close yourself into some space, not to uh, marginalize yourself within your gallery, but to cooperate with different sites and spaces that uh, were created at that time in New York in order to speak from different platforms, in order to use different opportunities. This is another example from Europe. This is Geneva. And um, that's a space that's called Eckhart. And it was uh, created by three uh, artists, John Arnleder, he is a very famous uh, Swiss artist, Patrick Lukin and Claude Swiss in 1960. Uh, so uh, it existed uh, between 1969 until the 80s. So uh, speaking about the first uh, site, uh, 112 Green Street, uh, it was um, um, uh, it was resonating with the artistic search uh, during that time. Post minimalism, land art, process art, conceptual art were all those references that uh, can be found there. And this uh, site is related to Fluxus. Fluxus was a very powerful European movement in those uh, uh, years. And John Armleder uh, and his colleagues, uh, uh, Claude Richter and Patrick Lugini, also belong to that art. So they opened uh, this uh, uh, space, ECART. It was a self-organized art initiative and non-commercial uh, um, uh, 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 space uh, uh, under the auspices of Fluxus in the art movement. So maybe it was not declared as a, as a manifesto, but it was uh, a continuation of uh, these artists' works, uh, of uh, those things that the artists used to do before they opened this place. Here we can see some pictures and photos of the exhibitions that happened there. This is a flyer uh, that announces uh, um, uh, the exhibition uh, in 1974. So three artists, like I said, um, they were working together. And they knew each other before they opened this space. They organized the Fluxus Festival in one of the hotels, actually in the cellars of the hotel in Geneva. 
and it belonged to arm leather's parents. So they could use this um, space for free, they were using it for several weeks and afterwards they decided to open their own place. And again, arm uh, leader's uh, parents um, uh, provided some space, they didn't have to pay, they just exhibited the works of their own. And those works uh, that were close to Fluxus artists from different um, countries, including Eastern Europe, but they needed money um, to um, uh, uh, well, um, uh, keep uh, going, so they had to publish some posters, uh, they had to make announcements about their uh, exhibitions, uh, publish flyers, so they had to create a publishing, um, a small publishing house, so they continued the publishing posters and also performed some commercial orders. They also began to publish books and uh, this, in the same gallery that they opened in 1972. Um, the those books um, they were sold, so this was not only the gallery but also a bookstore. This is the video that they produced and that's another example. Um, it will be my last example for today, so I'll be brief. Uh, and uh, This is a different uh, context, Hungary, Bu Budapest, Eastern Europe, and the art artist Jurgi Golontai, who is opening this space together with Julia Kolonis, his, uh, his wife, in Budapest. So before they opened uh, that uh, place, uh, in the time period between 1970 and 1973, they organized different performances, poetic, uh, readings in Georgi Balantai's um, studio in Balantai uh, uh, near uh, the um, uh, near Lake Balaton with all the activities taking place in summer. And here you can see some pictures uh, of the exhibitions. This is the exhibition um, uh, that took place in 1972. It wasn't for long that this uh, uh, place existed. So then they took a short break and then they decided to open an institution. And it's also it's really interesting because they, they were using a different model. So they started in the same tradition as, as 112 Green Street building and then they decided to open an institution that uh, based its um, um, activities um, on um, collecting materials and creating archive. So they focused on archive uh, work and art pool uh, now is uh, the, one of the most important art archives for art in Eastern Europe. So it is in Budapest. You can see uh, some photos um, of it. And uh, they um, were pursuing the concept of active archive. They say that they were not just collecting some materials of something that happened, they also participate in production of their archive, producing some things that would become part of their archive later on. So at first they uh, participate, uh, they worked illegally, and you can see, uh, you can find this information that uh, um, they were. Uh, um, chased by KGB and some other special services so they were uh, 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 and so they um, uh, got to the status as uh, like they got an official statement on uh, status only in 1992 so here you can see some materials that they uh, published for example the pool window it's a, a one page mail art um, with news, art news, then they um, published the newspapers, art pool uh, letter, and uh, they uh, also uh, had um, uh, radio programs so that they disseminated on uh, um, uh, tapes. Uh, they also had uh, a place um, where they held different uh, exhibitions, so here you can see archive and the gallery P P60. Um, that uh, art pool used for exhibitions. So I'm going to finish here and uh, 
As you can understand, those five places were very different uh, places, supported and maintained by the artists themselves in different contexts, at different times. But I think it's very interesting to look into different models and compare them. Thank you, Ileana. It's true that uh, even uh, here in Russia we uh, collected 50 initiatives during the last 15 years and uh, speaking about Europe uh, um, uh, um, throughout the period uh, uh, beginning of the 60s up to, uh, to now, of course uh, there were a tremendous uh, number of initiatives. So our um, uh, team members uh, uh, prepared uh, some books uh, uh, that are related to different self-organized uh, art initiatives and uh, you can find them in our collections.